The next three days, however, left me beginning to wonder if I had miscalculated the situation. I began tailing the man on Thursday after work and continued on through Friday, and even though I had all day Saturday instead of just after work, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He went to work at his job at construction down on the docks in a highly populated area and went directly to his car after work, then headed home. And during this entire period of tailing him, I saw no signs of Locklear whatsoever. By Sunday evening, when he was just working on the docks without incident, just like all the other days, I began to lose faith that this was a solid plan. Perhaps Locklear had finally had his share of victims from our city and decided to move on elsewhere. Or perhaps this case was so personal that he'd rather just ignore it altogether? I was still determined to do the right thing, but maybe I needed a new plan of attack. It was while I was lost in this train of thought that I missed my target exiting the work site. I reeled around in my car seat, straining my neck to see if he was already back to his car. But it still sat there, untouched. Frantically, I looked up and down the docks among the small groups of construction workers making their ways home. Suddenly, I spotted him again. However, instead of heading back away from the docks in the direction of his car like normal, he was walking down the docks, away from both his car and the work site. He was moving in a hurry, almost like he had spotted something he was trying to catch up to. I realized that if I didn't give chase, I'd lose sight of him completely as he would soon leave the industrial zone altogether. Pangs of nervousness and excitement shot through me. I knew I was going to have to follow on foot. Climbing out of my car, I made sure I had both my gun and my radio. My gut told me to call for backup right then, but since I was technically banned from working on the Locklear case, and I had been illegally following a man around, I needed to wait until I was 100% certain it was indeed Locklear himself. So I continued to follow on foot now. He was moving at a very quick pace, but I couldn't see what he was after. We had left the industrial part of the docks into a more derelict area full of abandoned warehouses and dilapidated old beams. This is the part where my gut really told me things weren't going to be good. Once again, my hand hovered over my radio, but I had not seen hide nor hair of Locklear and had no idea what the man was determinedly chasing. That was, at least, until the man broke into a dead run. That moment, a good distance ahead, I saw the form of a man emerge from the shadows. Even as the man I had been following charged him, he didn't move, though. He simply stood there while the other man grabbed him by his collar. I had no idea just what was going on by this point. They were both far enough away and in the shadows that I couldn't see anything more than silhouettes. The man from the shadows still did not move, even as the other man raised his clenched fist and swung it into his jawbone. However, within a moment, the man I had been tracking strangely started to slump down. Within seconds, he had gone limp as a rag doll and would have hit the ground if not for the other man now hoisting him over his shoulder. That's when our eyes finally met. There, nearly 200 meters in front of me, was Evander Locklear himself. The sun reflected menacingly off the glass goggles of his nightmarish plague mask. He gave a wicked, taunting laugh and then darted into the nearby building. I broke into a dead run, giving chase, but he was incredibly fast despite carrying a large, unconscious man. The moment I walked through the doors of the building, I realized it was an old slaughterhouse. By this point, every horror movie I had seen flashed through my mind, and I stopped in my tracks. The building was dark and quiet, with the exception of the sound of some distant chains softly rattling. There was no sign of Locklear or the man, so I decided it was beyond time to finally call for backup. The rules I broke be damned. This was worth the trouble I'd get in. 
However, no sooner than I had pulled my radio out of my pocket did I feel a breeze behind me and a sharp prick in my neck. I fumbled for my gun, but within seconds, everything had gone black. By the time I came back to, night had fallen. My eyes were blurry, and for a few moments I tried to focus them. I was laying down on something hard and cold. Immediately visions from my nightmare earlier that week flooded my mind and my pulse began to race. However, my limbs were unrestrained, and when my eyes finally focused, I realized I was not on a cold operating table. In fact, I wasn't anywhere new at all. Sitting up, I saw not a horrifying torture chamber, but the same rusty old abandoned building. I sat right beyond the entrance, just where I had been before I lost consciousness. I might have thought the whole thing some violent fever dream if I wasn't out on the docks during nightfall. I felt around my pockets, searching for my radio and gun. Of course he had taken them, but one could hope. My elbow seared with pain as I stood up. It must have hit the ground hard when I went down. It wasn't unbearable though, so I massaged it until the pain died down a bit. At least the good doctor was kind enough to leave me with my tiny pocket flashlight. I clicked the button, and a narrow stream of light illuminated a portion of the room around me. Shadows danced around the rusted old loading equipment, making me even more uneasy than before. What was his angle? Was this some kind of game to him? Why would he leave me here but take my badge, radio, and gun? Had he already fled? Was he going to hunt me down after this since he knew my name now and my workplace? My mind buzzed with these disturbing thoughts until I was snatched back to focus as a chilling sound echoed through the darkness beyond. It was the voice of a man screeching out in agony. It drifted from somewhere distant, deeper into the bowels of the slaughterhouse. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and for a brief moment I felt like a child in a scary story. After shaking out of it though, I began to take a step in the direction of the sound. Before I could get more than a few feet, however, I stopped myself. I needed backup. I couldn't do this alone and unarmed. I needed to be smart about this. The agonized whimper echoed again and I shivered, trying my best to ignore it. Weakly, I spun on my heel and headed back out to the entrance. Outside, the moon was bright enough that I no longer needed my little flashlight, so I began to stuff it back into the little pocket on my shirt again. However, while doing so, it bumped into something. Digging into the pocket, I realized there was a little piece of paper. I snatched it out and held it close enough to my eyes to see, despite the dim light. In small and incredibly smooth cursive script was a single sentence that made me feel sick to my stomach. Will you let them die? I froze in my tracks. So he was playing a game. I knew I shouldn't have given in, that I should just go back to town and get help. But his words haunted me. Would I let him die? The fact of the matter was, I had a choice to make. If I went for help, he'd surely be dead by the time it arrived. My radio was gone, and my car was all the way at the other end of the docks. And even then, since it was my personal vehicle, and not a cruiser with a built-in radio, I would have to drive to the nearest payphone, which could be miles from here. It was literally, get help, or try to save the man's life. Just one or the other. Slowly, I started moving away from the building once more. That man was a murderer, after all. If Locklear was in there, preoccupied with him, there might be time for backup to arrive and catch him at the scene. The life of a murderer wasn't too much of a price to pay, was it? I froze again. What was I thinking? It didn't matter who that man was. To just leave him at the mercy of a madman was inexcusably wrong. I was better than that. I was always better than that. My whole guiding principles in life were better than that. If I let myself justify his murder, everything that defined me as who I was would be out the window. No, I couldn't let him die. I wouldn't. 
wanting to slap myself for being so stupid and blatantly playing Locklear's game, I turned around and headed back into the looming old building. I had no idea what he had planned, but he had had the perfect opportunity to hurt me before, and didn't. So I wasn't sure what to expect. I still didn't know what I was going to do, but perhaps I could outwit him and turn the tables. Using my little flashlight once more, I looked around the dusty old loading bay. I spotted what looked like an old crowbar and dashed over to it. Though it was rusted and covered in cobwebs, it would still make a perfectly effective weapon. After all, Locklear specialized in knives, not guns. I doubted he was trained in them and I could possibly disarm him and knock him out with the crowbar. It was a bit of a stretch, but it was the best plan I could come up with in the heat of the moment. Taking a deep breath and readying myself, I headed to the doorway at the back of the room. Carefully, I poked my head through and peered about. Seeing no signs of danger, I proceeded. I was now in the processing part of the old factory. There were large old windows in various stages of disrepair lining the area, letting bright moonlight flood the path ahead. This was fortunate, as I realized that I would have to put away my flashlight so as not to give away my position. It had been a while since I had heard any cries of pain from the man, and I was beginning to worry. It was possible that, in the few minutes I had considered leaving the area, Locklear could have killed him, or even left the area. I tried not to think about these worst-case scenarios as I continued to trek onward. The building around me was that of a hellish nightmare landscape, a labyrinth of old conveyor belts running through frightening mechanical contraptions. There were large saw blades and hooks on chains hanging from a track lining the ceiling. Several times I nearly panicked, thinking I heard clangs from off in the dark, or saw a heavy chain swinging slightly. The room was cold, and the air tasted sour, like this was an unholy sort of place. I was nearly through the ghoulish maze of equipment when I saw him. Dead ahead, through yet another threshold, was the man Locklear had drug off. It was hard to make out much detail, as the room ahead didn't seem to have any windows, but I could make out his form from his pale skin shining from the sweat in the darkness. He was slouched over, his head hanging down. He appeared to be suspended in air, though, as his feet were not touching the ground. Holding my breath, I looked around frantically for any signs of Locklear. I couldn't see or hear any signs of him, so I decided to inch a bit closer. As I approached the doorway, I noticed the heavy, insulated door. Suddenly, I recognized that the room ahead as what was once a functioning meat freezer. It appeared to be broken now, though. The heavy door that was supposed to be airtight had holes rusted into it, and the temperature control panel smashed. Now closer, I could see the man a bit clearer. He still did not move or make a sound. I had no idea if he was still alive or not. I hesitated on the thought about entering to check. Seeing as the meat locker was a dead end, if Locklear was in there, it was possible that I might be able to lock him in with the heavy door. Deciding this was the best course of action, I pulled out my pocket flashlight once more and illuminated the chamber ahead. I had my hand at the ready to slam the heavy door, but other than the man, the chamber was empty. With the light of my flashlight now filling the locker, I could see the full extent of the man's suffering. He was indeed suspended off the ground. He was hoisted into the air by vicious old meat hooks sunken into the flesh of his back. He was soaked in blood, and his head lay limp in front of him. I had no idea if I was looking at a severely injured man, or a corpse. So I jolted forward to inspect him. I tried to take his pulse, but I had trouble locating it. I was in such a focused state of panic that I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard a soft voice coo from behind me. He's not dead, if that's what you're worried about, love. I recoiled, nearly dropping my flashlight and raising my crowbar, knowing full well it was now all but useless since he had gotten the jump on me. Dr. Evander Locklear... 
You are under arrest for charges of both murder and kidnapping. You have the right- I started shakily, but he cut me off quickly. Doctor, you're referring to me by my proper prefix. Usually they just call me Locklear. How refreshing your manners are. He chimed, his voice slightly muffled by his eerie mask. His demeanor was bizarre. I couldn't get a read on him and had no idea what he was going to do. Trying not to let the all-consuming fear that was now filling me seep into my voice, I tried again. You are under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Oh, you're really going to arrest me? He said mockingly with a chuckle. No, that's really precious. But pray tell, dearie, how do you plan to do so when I'm the one with the gun, and I see you choose to come here instead of getting back up? Interesting choice, my dear. Very interesting. I shuddered. His calm and, I dare say, pleasant demeanor threw me off. It was incredibly unnerving. I believe I would have been far less frightened if he had just screeched at me in an aggressive tone that matched his monstrous visage. Not knowing what else I could do, I decided to try talking to him. Why are you doing this? I asked, failing to keep my voice from quivering. Because he deserves it, he responded, this time cold and savage, no signs of his previous warmness. My turn! He exclaimed, immediately returning to his pleasant voice almost as quickly as he had become savage the moment before. Why did you choose to come here alone? Going off for backup was clearly the right decision, yet you choose to put your own life at risk for that filthy thing. Why? He inquired, tilting his head and looking like a nightmarish bird with his mask. If you want to talk to me, you're going to have to take that thing off. I said, pointing to his mask, shocked at my own brazenness. To my surprise, he didn't shout at me or remind me that he was the one in possession of the gun, so he made the demands. He simply chuckled softly and pulled his hood down, removing the mask as I had requested. <laughs> Fair enough. He laughed. Finally, his voice was clear without the mask muffling it. I was a bit taken aback. He didn't look like a madman that had been on the run for several years. He was clean, and he appeared well cared for. His light olive skin didn't sink into his cheeks like someone underfed, and his long black hair was neatly tied behind him. If he weren't the most wanted man in the city, he could have just waltzed back into a hospital, masquerading as a doctor, and no one would think him out of place. He noticed my baffled staring and broke into an amused grin his strangely blue eyes piercing into me like an icy knife. Everything about the man in front of me made me uneasy. There. No more mask. Now, answer my question. He chimed in his eerily cheerful voice. I swallowed hard, still not knowing what his angle was. Odds were that he was just playing cat and mouse, toying with me before killing me along with the man. I would have to find a way to disarm him before it got to that. What I needed now was to stall for time. So I'd answer his questions and play his game for now. If I'm honest, I knew this was the dumb decision. But if I just abandoned him here while I ran off into town, he'd die. I don't care what he's done, it would still be wrong, and I would have to live with his blood on my hands, I finished honestly knowing I might as well be truthful for fear of him rooting out a lie and getting angry. He stared at me in seeming fascination. A slight smirk danced on his lips before he responded. You're an interesting one, Bernadette. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up when he said my name. It took a moment with my pulse raising in my ears, wondering how he knew my name, before I remembered that he had taken my badge. I sincerely hoped he hadn't seen the momentary panic in my eyes, but his smirk growing into a predatory grin told me he had indeed picked up on it. He was reveling in the power imbalance of our situation. Before he could speak again, the silence was broken by the man on the meat hook seemingly regaining consciousness. Whatever he was on was clearly a much stronger dose than I had received, as his eyes were glazed over and he was drooling on himself. However, he still seemed to be in an immense amount of pain. 
As he pathetically tried to lift his head, he released the most pitiful moan. Wet tears dripped from his face, and I immediately began to feel sick. You have to let him go, I said again, more insistent this time. He doesn't deserve this. A dark shadow overtook Locklear's face. Once again, his voice had lost all traces of warmth as he spoke. Does he now? He spat unsympathetically. I hesitated to respond, as he was beginning to look quite agitated. Doesn't deserve this. Him. This worm didn't think it was a problem to knock his wife around. I'm sure it made him feel real powerful. He got a little carried away, though, the last time. Smashed her face in with a wrench. Never mind that she was four months pregnant. It must have been an honest mistake. He's a good guy, though, really. He doesn't deserve it. Locklear finished, his voice rising with each sentence until he was shouting like a madman. He went silent for a moment before shifting on a dime to a soft, gentle voice as he looked at me. You see how silly you sound. Tears at the verge of rising up in my eyes, I weakly responded before I could stop myself. Killing him isn't going to bring your wife back. I immediately knew I had crossed a line. His icy eyes filled with rage and he pointed a shaking finger at me before bellowing. You know nothing about Evangeline. I recoiled, closing my eyes, certain he would charge me at that moment. But a few seconds passed, and all I could hear was heavy breathing. Looking up, his face no longer looked enraged, but filled with intense sorrow. You have no idea what it's like. One minute you have everything that you could have ever dreamed of. A radiant wife. A healthy child on the way. And then, in the blink of an eye, you've lost it all. He said, his voice barely hanging above a whisper. I'll never forget that day. I should have been at home with her. But I got called in for an emergency surgery. A young man had been shot and needed an extremely delicate procedure. As soon as possible, he would certainly have died. I left her there. I went to the man instead. I never kept my phone on me in the OR, and no one is allowed to interrupt highly sensitive operations, so I couldn't have known. I had no idea that while I was working to save the young man, my wife had gone into premature labor. They told me that they did everything they possibly could to save her and the child, but the complications claimed them both. I couldn't make eye contact with him while he spoke. Despite the tension, there was now a heavy, melancholic aura weighing down on the room. He continued to speak, his voice cold and dry. I saved the man, of course. I'm an excellent surgeon, the best at what I do, but the sick irony that awaited me, nothing could have prepared me for. You see, I got out of the operating room, ready to celebrate a grand success, only to find myself mourning the loss of my whole world. That alone is enough to destroy a man, but the real kicker, though, was the man I had just saved was shot for a reason. He had just been acquitted for rape and murder of a high school girl. Her father hunted him down and shot him. And I saved him. Locklear's voice was now filled with rage once more. You see, Miss Devereux, once upon a time I tried to take the high road, choosing to save a man because he didn't deserve it, and look what it got me! The world is not so black and white, dearie. Sometimes bad people do evil things and go unpunished. So because they bested the legal system is all right. Or some childish mantra of killing them makes you no know better. That's garbage. We both know it. Can you really compare killing a violent murderer with a slaughtering an innocent victim? Forget your holier-than-thou moral code for a moment and answer honestly. These people need to atone for their sins, and I'm making sure they do. Disagree with my methods, but can you really say I'm wrong? By this point, I was extremely shaken. I tried to gather myself before responding. Yes, I still think it's wrong. You don't get to decide who lives and dies. Why am I wrong? And why not? This sham of a legal system certainly isn't doing a bang-up job of it. You've seen the evidence of this case. You know this man is guilty. Are you really okay with him murdering his wife and child and going back to his life like nothing happened? Locklear pressed, cutting into me with his accusing eyes. I'm not okay with it, but we have a legal system for a reason. Sometimes it fails, but that doesn't mean we can just write off the whole thing. I shot back, 
my voice shaking. So this murderer just gets to skip off into the sunset. Is that what your little moral code deems as right? He whispered, eyes narrowing. No, it's... I don't know, I responded, not sure of how to answer his questions at this point. So what is it? Do you think it's acceptable for him to murder innocents as he pleases without consequence? Or is it better to snuff that evil out of this world before it can harm another? It's not like... You don't understand, I shouted back. I think it's you who doesn't understand. You don't even know what you believe in. Locklear cooed at me. That's not true! I have based my whole life on my beliefs. You're just using wordplay to try and convolute my thoughts! I shouted back in defiance. So perhaps you should look for a new direction to lead your life. It doesn't seem like a very solid belief system if you can't even tell me what's right or wrong. He shrugged. But killing him would be wrong. Regardless of the type of man he is, you're adding more hate and violence to the world. I shot back at his dismissal. That's where you're wrong, dear girl. You've been following my case, haven't you? I don't just kill for the sake of killing. I'm going to take his organs. There are a great deal of good innocent people who are dying because the donor lists are too long, and they're not rich enough to get preferential treatment. Through various contacts of mine, I'll make sure that they get the organs they need. The death of one evil man can save multiple innocents. Is that really so wrong? It must have been a combination of the strange atmosphere of the meat locker and my lack of sleep because my thoughts were starting to drift. I knew that however he tried to justify it, it didn't make his actions right. But I couldn't stop that tiny, invasive thought growing in the back of my mind. His actions may not be right, but they also may not be entirely wrong. No, what was I thinking? Was I really letting his mind games get to me? My eyes shifted to the man on the hook. Memories of footage of the court case flooded my mind. At his acquittal, he showed no signs of remorse or even sadness. He had worn a smug, triumphant expression as his name was cleared. Meanwhile, his pregnant wife would never be able to smile again. Anger started to fill my chest, and that ever-intrusive little thought continued to chip away at me. Suddenly, Locklear's now soft voice cut through my thoughts. It's getting late, Bernadette. You really should run along now. There's not much time left. Baffled and honestly irritated at his suggestion, I regained my fire and shot back. I can't just leave, I said stubbornly. What if I try and stop you? Then I'll have to tranquilize you again. Wait, wouldn't it just make more sense to kill me too? No. No? But I figured out your pattern. I know you don't work alone with the organs now. What if I take that information right back to the station and a whole SWAT team comes for you? You won't do that. And I'm not killing you. You are neither guilty of a heinous crime nor a necessity. You're willing to risk that? Locklear closed his eyes and calmly replied once more. I'm not going to kill you. And you're not going to tell. We both know this. I burned with an indignant rage. I am a cop, damn it! It's time for you to go, he said calmly, ignoring my outburst completely. I froze for a moment, staring at him numbly. What was happening to me? He read the look in my eyes and stepped to the side, unblocking the entrance to the meat locker and motioning me to leave. My pulse pounded in my ears, and I slowly lifted my feet, drifting in the direction he indicated. My footsteps echoed throughout the otherwise silent building. I grew closer and closer to the doorway and Locklear himself. His icy blue eyes locked onto me the entire time. For the first time, his face was devoid of emotion, as if intently waiting to see what I would do. I was now only a few feet from the infamous madman, yet he did not strike. He simply continued to watch me. I swallowed hard, seeing my firearm sticking loosely out of his cloak pocket. When I was but a foot away, the man on the hook began to fuss again. For just a second, Locklear looked away from me and to his victim, but that second was enough for me to pounce. In a flash, I wrenched my hand into his cloak pocket and reclaimed my gun. 
However, no sooner did I make contact with my weapon, I felt a strong grip enclose my shoulder, yanking me forward. Suddenly, I found myself face to face with the doctor. With only inches between us, I pressed the gun tight into his chest. There was a moment of silence where we simply stared into each other's eyes. Despite the barrel of my weapon against his very flesh, he didn't look the slightest bit concerned, or even shocked for that matter. Once again, it felt as though he were playing with my mind. His mouth stretched into one last sadistic grin before the deafening bang resounded within the rusty old chamber. I slowly exited the slaughterhouse and stumbled back to my car. My ears rang and countless thoughts and visions flashed through my mind. I felt sick to my stomach, yet numb at the same time. I couldn't go into work the next day. I couldn't go back at all. Calloway was heartbroken that I was leaving, but I can't do it anymore. I should have listened to him when he told me to drop it. Even though I had solved the mystery, it was at way too great of a price. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know what I believe. Locklear managed to get into my head, and I don't think it can ever be fixed. I know he was just trying to get me to question my morals and belief system that guided me my whole life as a means of toying with me. I know this yet the damage is still done. Because despite his intent, I am ashamed to admit that some of the things he said actually made sense to me, on at least some level, even if I could not condone it. I can't continue to serve when I've become compromised in such a way. I know many police do, but out of respect for the woman I was, I can't do that. Not with a clean conscience. More than any other reason, however, is what I did. I cannot continue to serve my city with this blood on my hands. It will forever haunt me. Even now, I still hear the ringing in my ears. The sound of my unfired pistol slamming into the bitterly cold concrete of the slaughterhouse floor. I had no idea exactly what horrors awaited the man suspended on the hook, but I knew he was going to die, and most likely in a horrible and gruesome manner. And in that moment I chose to walk away, I consciously condemned him to it, and was now just as responsible for his fate as Locklear himself. The good doctor had given me the most peculiar expression as I dropped the gun. Gently releasing me from his grip, he watched me walk through the doorway and out of the locker. I turned back one last time as he called out to me. See, Bernadette, I told you, you wouldn't tell. His face broke into the warmest, most genuine smile, and it left me feeling utterly sick to my stomach. I walked away, not responding, and letting him just fade into the shadows. It is now, in hindsight, that I believe he planned this whole thing out. Like the scientist he was, creating an elaborate maze for a rat. He knew I had been investigating him. For how long, I don't know. In the very least, I believe he discovered me also tailing his prey. The pieces all fit. Why else would he lure his victim someplace so close to where I was stationed? He wanted me to see him wanted me to follow him. I don't know what he wanted from the encounter. Perhaps it was just a game to mess with my head. If so, he seems to have won. But I'm still struggling to understand. He never laid a finger on me, yet I feel so deeply violated. God, I was such an idiot. I have trouble sleeping now. My, my thoughts don't give me much rest. There are some nights where a shiver runs down my spine and I swear I can feel those piercing blue eyes boring into me from some unseen place. I'm not afraid of him coming back to get me. He's not a boogeyman that's waiting to kill me. He made this clear at the warehouse. No, 
I'm no longer afraid of that man. The thing that has me utterly horrified is that I think I'm starting to believe that he's right. <laughs>